But again, going back to our survey findings, going back to what I cover, which is meeting rooms, 37% um, of the companies we surveyed uh, said that they are going to be building more meeting rooms. And this is, this is a pretty impressive number, more so because 24% of the companies surveyed said that they are reducing the real estate. So what this means is meeting room density. Hi, and welcome back to the Teams Insider podcast. Really interesting one this week. We've got Rupan Jain, who's VP of Research at Frost & Sullivan's Connected Work Practice. And she gives us a really deep insight into what's going on in the room space, the kind of back to work, hybrid working, the importance of BYOD and how big actually BYOD is and how the big platforms are influencing the video market as well. Many thanks to Rupan for taking the time to jump on the podcast. Really appreciate her sharing her insights. And also thanks to Crestron, who are the sponsor of this podcast. Really appreciate their support. On with the show. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the pod. Uh, excited to do this one. Rupam and I have been going back and forward trying to find a time for quite a while between our diaries. Um, but now we're locked in. Uh, Rupam, thanks for coming. Do you want to just introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Rupam Jain, VP of Research at Frost & Sullivan's Connected Work Practice. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Frost & Sullivan, we are a global consulting and market research firm. We have uh, more than 35 office locations globally, if I have the latest count, um, and we cover multiple industries, uh, industrial, healthcare, automotive, many others. I'm part of the ICT practice at Frost, and I have covered conferencing and collaboration technologies for over two decades now, actually. I just completed 25 years this past August. Amazing. So Congrats. That I, is, that's, I'm truly that's an industry lot. insider, Tom. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's an incredible run, and what a, what a transformation over that time as well. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast, I know, and for being patient with my schedule. And oh, no, it's, yeah, it's mine as much as yours. I, we, yeah. uh, we, I think we overlap at some some industry events as well, uh, often on different tracks and things. So it's great to spend some time chatting. So thanks for that. Yes. Um, so yeah, so Frost and Sullivan, obviously, massive, super impactful reporting. Lots of good, you know. I know you do lots of customer surveys and stuff, but your your space, more specifically within ICT and, and Collab, is more around the kind of rooms and video market. Is that right? Yes, I mean, I cover meetings, video, but that sort of overlaps everything else that's happening in the workplace. I mean, technologies are not clearly differentiated. We are seeing a lot of convergence across the board. So um, I, I look at everything tangential to that also. Yeah, and, and from from that point of view, obviously, there's been a rise of the, the, the UCAS platforms and collaboration, you know, coming together and appliance-based video versus standards-based video. I mean, where's a good jump off point in, in terms of what you're seeing in the market? I think just taking a step back and looking at how the overall workplace is evolving, because that feeds into technology transformation and digital transformation. Um, an interesting thing that we are seeing this year is that the wheels are sort of fully in motion in terms of tech adoption. Uh, things like office modernization, even contact center modernization, infrastructure upgrades. And really, when we talk of um, office redesign in particular, right, workplace redesign for hybrid work, meeting rooms are a fundamental part of that conversation. Um, so when it comes to meeting rooms and spaces, and I think you and I discussed this at one point, last year was um, sort of a year of wait and watch for IT DMs. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty around how many employees will be back in the office for how many days. Um, there was this constant debate whether we should be in the office or not and so on. And this year, we are starting in our customer conversations, we are starting to see the dust sort of settle down on that. And this is the year when we are seeing stabilization in hybrid work plans. Um, so at Frost & Sullivan, we conduct uh, a lot of global surveys of IT decision makers and business leaders. And our recent surveys show um, an accelerated return to the office for sure, you know, and it's it's been going up consistently and the proportion of remote work time has consistently gone down. Um, so in our latest survey, it was a full 10 percentage points higher in office presence was a full 10 percentage points higher than previous years. Um, but equally interesting is um, the fact that the deviation 
between the current state of hybrid work and the future plans, you know, where companies are today and where they want to be, that has narrowed down quite a bit. So the deviation was only three percentage points in this year's survey compared to where we were uh, in the past, which I think was close to twice as much. So what this means is um, people are getting closer to where they ultimately want to be with their hybrid work policy. Uh, you know, whatever version of hybrid work strategy that works best for their business, works for their corporate culture. And we know many a times that mandate comes from the top, from the C-suite. So IT teams, facilities, HR are uh, taking those next concrete steps now because they know where they have, have landed. They finally are moving on those office modernization projects. They are uh, moving faster on the digital transformation projects, whether it's the contact center or unified communications or meeting rooms, and then, you know, sort of putting the right technology in the right space. Right, so, so they're, they're sort of getting stable on what they're, yeah. wherever they've landed percentage-wise between remote and office, they're sort of like, that. that is kind of how it's going to be going forward maybe we want to push it slightly more in one direction or slightly more on the other but we know enough of what's going on and what the you know new normal don't love that phrase but like this is how it is we can get on with our our workplace strategy in terms of platforms and and rooms exactly so you know i i call this uh, a year of recovery you know especially for video devices last year was brutal we are we are seeing a good level of market recovery this year so obviously that meeting room trans uh, transformation is also happening uh, but i think uh, tom it's equally important um, to note that this sort of workplace transformation is happening in tandem with two other big trends um, you can guess <laughs> AI, try AI like transformation. <laughs> I, wondered, I wondered how long before we get to AI. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, of course, a huge, huge focus on employee experience. I, I, I'm not having a single conversation uh, with anyone either in the tech community or even on the customer side where they're not talking about ways to improve the employee experience. Um, so I think these three tech trends are sort of, you know, really shaking things up. Um, but again, going back to our survey findings, going back to what I cover, which is meeting rooms, 37% um, of the companies we surveyed uh, said that they're going to be building more meeting rooms. And this is, this is a pretty impressive number, more so because 24% of the companies surveyed said that they are reducing the real estate. So what this means is meeting room density in workplaces going up, you know, so, you know, whether people are getting back into the office three days or four days a week, they want more collaboration, more networking, ideation, discussion. So more collaborative spaces within offices is happening. Different types of spaces are coming up. You know, it's not just your typical uh, small, mid, large meeting room with four walls. We're talking of open collab spaces, meeting pods, jump spaces, quiet spaces. Yeah, I see lots work. of like I mean, there's divisible, a, there's a divisible and high end. And <laughs> like, 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 and that really resonates anecdotally with what I've seen, which is, we're coming to the office to do something but that's still going to be possibly a hybrid meeting scenario so we want a, it's not coming in to sit at the hot desk and do meetings all day it's coming into a space exactly that defeats the purpose of the commute um so yes and and uh, you know what i call the emergence of the experiential office you you want a certain experience when you do go to the office and so you know everything is kind of getting redefined and reimagined and video communication is a big part of it but video is a given right i mean i don't remember the last time i had a call that was audio only and i don't think we will have you you may choose to disable video because you know the use case doesn't require you to show your video but video is a given the conversation is also shifting to video plus experiences, like a complete collaboration experience, better content collaboration, whether it's from the device perspective, from the platform that's going into these spaces. Intelligent audio is just such a huge thing. You know, you, you just get, you can make the audio better and better so that it becomes perfect, you know, and then, then video follows, content collaboration follows. I think it's, it's all about having these multiple flexible ways of collaboration and it transcends uh, to more than video and just better collaboration everywhere. That's awesome. So, so you're seeing more interest in those experiential, like it's not just a hundred standard meeting rooms it, it, it's more about how are we going to use the space and and like it does that lean towards higher end kit like seating mics and kind of kitted out rooms or not necessarily it does i mean it, it, i think at the end of the day it's all about mapping the technology to your space needs 
you know, and, and, and also keeping the user personas in mind, keeping user preferences and use cases in mind. So the end goal, and this is where we see a huge shift, you know, if you go back by 10 years, um, the technology sort of took precedence, you know, the technology was chosen and then the users were expected to adapt to technology. And now the end goal is to connect people, to connect teams, and then make technology decisions accordingly, not the other way around. So I think this is just a very good shift. Um, and, and then of course, there are so many options. I mean, there's a device for every space. There is a platform for every space. Uh, you know, there's, there's appliance mode, there's standards based rooms, and there are pros and cons. And um, those decisions are being based on what best fits each organization or each business's needs. Awesome. And um, what are you seeing in terms of, obviously, we've had the, 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 the UCAS platforms, like, I know you look across the whole market, so it'd be interesting to get your perspective. Like, I feel like uh, back in, certainly when I started in this space, the facilities team would choose the, the room kit and somebody else would have a decision on the, the desktop. It, is the desktop or the platform decision or the cloud decision influencing the kit decision? How are you seeing that play out? Definitely. I, I, I think um, a lot of the technology decisions are being based on the platform of choice, the collaboration platform of choice that the company is standardizing on. Uh, but the reality is there is no single platform. It's, it's multiple platforms, right? And it can vary by depart departments. It can vary by um, you know, just, just different ask, different uh, locations. You know, those yeah. decisions can be made at the branch level. Um, so I think the platform decision is important, but if, if we talk about meeting spaces or rooms, it's also about the form factor, um, you know, and, and so appliances, collab bars, for example, there's been such a massive uptake for that. And that's essentially because of the- I, feel like, I feel like every vendor's got a collab bar at the moment. I think we're up to like- yeah. It's an overcrowded market for space. indeed. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, and, and that's because, you know, it's it's a, an integrated solution, be it MTR or Zoom rooms and just an all-in-one solution with hardware and software designed to work together seamlessly makes the IT manager's job easy, you know, ease of deployment. Um, yeah, it brings, it brings the cost down, brings the price down, like they're, they're relatively simple to deploy. So you're not into multi-day projects. So there's, there's, a, there's a kind of TCO thing there where you can deliver a good experience for, for a lot less than you used to be able to potentially. Exactly. Yeah. And, and consistent user experience, right? So as users go from one room to another, they, they have a, a consistent experience, but often there is a vendor lock-in involved, you know, and, and I think the other end of the spectrum, spectrum is standards-based systems just give more um, choice of components, more flexibility, um, better interop between different platforms yeah. and devices. So, you know, there is there are pros and cons to each. Um, but of course, those modular standards-based rooms, um, especially for mid-sized and large rooms, you know, they require more technical expertise. So there are cost considerations, uh, cost related to maybe AV integration. Uh, but like I said earlier, it all boils down to what kind of meeting spaces you have, what are the use cases you are enabling, and then, of course, what are user preferences and, you know, IT, what is easy for IT from a management monitoring um, perspective. Makes sense. And what do you see? We mentioned how many collab bar vendors there are there, like, and you mentioned IT management. How do you see organizations dealing with ch choice of kit? Like, because uh, there's obviously an overhead if mixing lots of different management platforms, lots of different kit. Are you seeing them standardized? Are you seeing them flex on that? How, any thoughts on that? I think just as we are seeing best of breed on the type of platform, we, we are seeing best of breed when it comes to management um, platform choices. So I, I think there's a, there are multiple solutions, but it is becoming a critical factor in tech selection. So any, any vendor that lacked a robust management platform, whether it's from a device perspective or otherwise, uh, was definitely losing out. So it's, it's a, it's a big, big deal. IT, and, and, you know, there's a lot going on in organizations that are BYOD rooms that are outside of the purview of IT. IT doesn't want to even know that those rooms exist. But yeah. the rooms that they know exist, that they are uh, deploying, and, you know, the, the, those are the ones that they want full visibility into. And they want those central 
management, monitoring, all of those, um, you know, advanced capabilities. <clears throat> yes, that's a that's a key part of the decision making process. It's not just does it have these cameras and these mics, but actually what's the what's the day two management experience and the the reporting, those kind of things. Exactly. Awesome. So you touched on BYOD there. I want to I want to jump on that because that's really interesting at the moment. I feel like BYOD has like got a renaissance at the moment because now we've got yeah. network connected BYOD. We've got finally got one cable with USB C. I, I think you did some research around this as well. What, what's your your experience of the BYOD in the market versus appliances and standards based rooms? BYOD just it, it it's just it's around and it will always be around and it fits sort of squarely into um, the whole collaboration experience and, and clear cut reasons for it, right? Users have te technology preferences. They want those easy experiences and businesses want the flexibility and cost effectiveness. I mean, I've spoken to quite a few customers that have deployed appliances, but are using it in BYOD mode. So, you know, and, and it's just because of the advantages of BYOD that um, surpass like those, um, you know, specific vendor driven solutions in certain rooms. Um, and I, I just want to quote a stat here, and it's actually, you must have seen it. It's a very publicized and used stat across the industry that comes from Frost and Sullivan that only about 15% of the meeting spaces today globally are video enabled. And so that stat, um, because it's coming from us, we know it, it counts only dedicated purpose-built video devices. It does not include BYOD-driven video spaces. So if we add BYOD to the mix, that number is probably twice as high. Um, oh, interesting. So, That's a very yeah, good, so, good, good important part of that stat. That's interesting to hear. Right. So it's big. BYOD is big. It's uh, roughly 50% of all uh, meeting spaces that are equipped with any sort of video um, in our BYOD spaces. So it's the simplicity, the flexibility to collaborate over a meeting platform of your choice. It's also cost effective. And so it's here to stay. And, and I know, Tom, you, you cover everything uh, Teams and uh, Microsoft 365 related. If you look at just the efforts that Microsoft has made over the last couple of years or so, um, you know, they've taken so many initiatives to make these spaces more usable, um, discoverable. You know, I, I saw a demo of um, the Teams shared display mode a few months back, um, things like auto discovery of devices where, you know, teams can detect shared devices in a BYOD room and add it to the list um, in the, the, the pro teams portal. So improving the visibility from an IT admin po uh, point of view. Yeah, there's so been a real focus at Microsoft on, on BYOD and accepting BYOD and optimizing it as well. The, the client now does some clever things around. If it understands the BYOD room, it will throw the correct thing on the big screen. It will also configure the audio and video. Uh, I really feel like there's been a big change in Microsoft in the last few years. Like it was very much Microsoft Teams rooms are the, 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 the one true way to do it right to actually, if you talk to the Microsoft's biggest customers, they even when they've got a thousand plus MTRs, as, as your stats allude to, they still have BYOD in play and they still want that experience to be good as well. Exactly. And I think the end goal is um, as IT admins can associate those discovered devices to rooms, right? They can assign room licenses if they want to go down that road. So that's... Yeah, that's the, the, the there's something you touched on as well. It's interesting that I've heard with customers, which is actually... <laughs> for better or worse, people understand how their laptop works because they use it every day and they can be more comfortable plugging in a USB-C than they can trying to work the meeting room, even if it's a simple meeting room, because they, they, they might only come into the office three times a month and use the room. They're, they're running into work. They kind of, they can understand. They've, they've sort of through being, you know, particularly the, the hybrid period, like constantly using zoom or webex or teams they know how to switch a device they know how to use their client but they might not know how to use the room so actually that drives them to want to plug in rather than using the room in some scenarios exactly and and they bring their preferred apps into the meeting space yeah that's another um uh, a real benefit in terms of platform is everything that works on a laptop or a device is going to work as well so versus that kind of appliance model yeah awesome so you touched on AI, I, I'm, well, we have to talk about AI, right? It's 2024, that's, that's the rules. Um, but what are you seeing specifically in room technology? Because a lot, a lot of the vendors are talking about infusing AI, direction, cleverer audio. Are you seeing 
customers see value in that? Are you seeing in like is that is that changing the experience? Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, that's we could probably do a separate podcast on that. But um, I mean, the thing is, the needle is moving fast on AI, and just in my conversations with customers over the last 12 months or so, you know, I'm, I'm seeing that progression, I'm talking to more and more companies that are moving from proof of concept to implementation and implementation at scale, right? Because they're starting to see the tangible value. They are seeing the impact on business outcomes. You know, it's not just about AI for productivity sake. It's not just about AI to get things done um, faster. It's about how can AI help you do things better, right? So creativity, innovation, just things that, we don't have the skill set for where AI can come and complement everything. So I think employees, the users are getting it, business leaders are getting it, and, and we are seeing so much movement on that. Now, when it comes to meeting rooms, I mean, AI has been impacting meeting rooms for a while. So it's not like a net new thing, um, but just to kind of uh, lay out where AI is playing in the meeting room, I sort of look at it from a four different category perspective. The first one is, language processing, advanced language processing. So this is where we've already seen a lot of adoption, you know, things like transcription um, and, you know, gen AI meeting summaries and insights. And I think that's probably the most widely adopted AI feature today in meetings. Um, Real-time translation, I think that's such a game changer, could be a game changer for how we communicate across geographies and so on. Um, AI enhanced audio video, that's like the second category where a lot of uh, advancements have already happened. Intelligent framing, intelligent tracking. I mean, that's been around for a while. Hmm. Um, but now this whole idea of multi-directional conversations that happen in meeting space and how can AI capture that best video view. Um, it's just like multi-camera implementation and that's getting better and better. The first generation of multi-camera implementation was sort of clunky and not easy, and it's getting better, it's getting more affordable. So that's another leap that we are seeing in terms of just making those meetings more engaging and more uh, equitable. Uh, intelligent audio, I mean, that's huge. I'm, I'm really big on how audio can actually change the experience fundamentally. And, you know, it's, it's things like advanced noise cancellation, auto audio enhancement. Um, I think it will also come into play in terms of accents and differences across languages. It, it's going to make that experience so seamless that once we move beyond the audio experience, we can actually capture everything else that's happening around us. Um, the other, uh, so I covered advanced language processing, AI enhanced audio video. Um, the other one is uh, the impact on IT management and analytics, right? So it's just, AI is not just for better user experience. We, we, when you look at data aggregation and analytics and actionable room insights and um, things like even occupancy and workplace optimization, it's just helping businesses improve the sustainability posture. So, you know, and I, I think AI is just going to have a huge, huge role in terms of energy management. Um, using the sensors and kind of feeding all that information. So um, these these are the, the big areas. But the fourth area, which is not so much a tech advancement rather than usability. And I, I think this is a very early stage of simplifying AI for the average user. And so I think where this is where we need to probably as an industry make the most progress is take AI from complexity to simplicity and making AI more persona-based, making it more use case-based. So today, we have a lot of AI around us, but we have to go to AI to use it, but AI coming to the user. So that's that's the big change. So I, I think um, it's, it's just a lot. It's just a lot, and it's happening at such a fast pace. And like I said, I'm having some really exciting customer conversation, customers that have essentially taken the leap of faith and deployed AI across that entire organization to every employee, AI licenses, yeah. all the way up to some that are still sitting on the fence. And that's a small percentage, by the way, it's shrinking. Uh, according to our latest survey, only 20% are still just, you know, in the stage of getting to AI awareness. And the remaining 80% are implementing AI at some scale, 
could be just one focused, you know, uh, app or um, team within their company or a full scale implementation. But there are some that talk about AI being scary, you know, because there are so yeah, many. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 there's valid when you look after data and customer data that there's, there's there's valid concerns. I think there to know what you're doing for sure. Yeah, yeah. So you know, whether it's security, privacy, regulatory, or ethical issues, there's there's a lot of lot that can be done and a lot that will probably also act as uh, putting a guardrail around AI uh, maybe over the next few years. Yeah, I love how you break down those different areas it's impacting because you're right it's across it's across the board and like it's interesting when I hear those customers who are like we're not not doing AI I'm like that, that AI is being used in your organization in some some shape or form. It's just how how it's being used and how sanctioned or not not sanctioned it is. But the, the the thing you were talking about about the AI coming to the user, I think that's really interesting in our space because potentially moving from as you as you said there, I as an individual go to the meeting summary and drive some information out of it. That idea of having agentic like someone comes in and co-facilitates the meeting like i've had these meetings where you have these awesome you know project managers or facilitators who get everybody engaged all that kind of stuff if we could bring even a fraction of that in in ai i think that's really interesting exactly i i think these are exciting times i i call it the golden age of technology so there's good times yeah. to be in yeah yeah definitely it's really really interesting and ai is just just accelerating all those conversations. Awesome. Well, I, I, know, I know we're tight on time, Rufan, so thank you so much. It seems like we've got, to, we came across two other podcast topics. We're going to have to loop back and, and do another one sometime, but I really appreciate you taking the time and, and giving us the insight into the stats. Um, if people want to find out more about you and your work or Frost and Sullivan, what's the best thing to do? Well, you can go to our portal, www.frost.com and, um, you know, if or reach out to me directly um, on LinkedIn and I will, you know, we, we do a lot. We do a lot as a company. So I'll put you in touch with the right folks. Great. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. Good seeing you.